Okay, so I am Brian Cardell. I am a developer advocate at Egalia. And I'm Eric Meyer. I'm also a developer advocate at Egalia. On today's show, we're going to talk about the CSS Working Group face-to-face that happened last week. So we have broken this down into uh, six, I think. Is it six? So the Working Group, somewhat sensibly, tends to group things together for the discussion, right? So like all of the element sizing stuff is on the afternoon of day one. So when you go through the, the sort of the minutes of the meeting or the the, the GitHub um, board, it has, you know, morning day one, and then there's all this stuff that's related. So we kind of have six topic areas because there were six half days in the three-day meeting. I think a thing that a lot of people probably don't understand is that The CSS working group, like any software project, is full of people with specializations. If you're talking about, for example, internationalization or typography or, you know, fonts or (laughs) SVG, like not everybody is equally versed in all of those topics. And so you need to make sure that if you have remote participants, like, they can sign on for the piece where they're like really, really critical to the discussion. Yep. And uh, as speaking as a remote participant, uh, which I was, uh, that was, it was, it was helpful. Although I sat in on everything because I'm not actually a specialist in any of these things. (laughs) So it was, it, right. It was interesting to be able to just sort of follow the conversation uh, around various things. I mean, there were, there was a lot of the working group, meeting where where I was like, wow, there are two or three people who know exactly what they're talking about. Having a discussion about this, I have nothing to add. <laughs> it, it's I, true of many, many CSS working group meetings. That there are a, a, a few people who are the, like the specialists and our, our cross review gives opportunity for other people to ask questions. But like largely the discussion is driven by generally small group of people who are doing the work right but a different small group of people for each topic yes though there there are a few people who are like common people on many topics uh those are the a really really small group of people who are like the sort of primary css engineer for an engine so you have like emilio cobos from mozilla uh previously david baron from mozilla uh, or somebody who is like a professional spec writer, like Tab Atkins, right. who or by Summit. nature by nature has to be um, able to explain it. And uh, yeah, Elika as well is in that same group. Yeah. So yeah, you'll see them if you read through minutes like quite a lot. Yeah. Well, let's let's dive in. The morning of the first day was. What I mean, it what they didn't say. This these are the typography things. That's sort of how I summarized it. Was they were about typography, like uh, issue five thousand two, <laughs> which uh, is all about what do you do with underlines when the box, like the element that you're decorating, is higher or for that matter lower than the baseline position. And you might think that that's really trivial, and yet it's it's really complicated. <laughs> yeah, this is actually. Um, I'm going to take a brief non sequitur here. Um, I okay. don't know if you managed to anybody listening to the show uh, look up uh, Florian's talk from a couple of years ago on like white space and line breaking, and, and it will be. And honestly, it is not everything, but it will be like an hour long talk on white space and line breaking, mm-hmm. and. It is amazingly complicated. Like it is amazingly complicated. And maybe just before the pandemic, I know you know this, Eric, but Brad Frost lives here in Pittsburgh. And I I went over to Brad's house to talk to him about something. And uh, this came up and he said, man, I just like it. CSS makes it so magical. Like you just sort of take the complexity for granted. And then you see a presentation like that and you realize wow, this is a lot of work. Like there's so much in here. We've made text seem simple, but it's like just about the most complicated thing you can do. And um, the reason that I bring that up is because 
if we dig into this, you'll see like all kinds of nuances and questions where it's really, really hard. So like we have two issues here that are uh, both about effectively like underlining. <laughs> yeah, underlining and in general text decoration. So actually we could take the second one first. So there was there's a CSS text decoration issue open uh, on how to use decoration skipping. Like, can you use decoration skipping to turn off underlines? So as an example, decoration skipping is where uh, people might have noticed if, if you use underlines in the, have used underlines recently, when you have a descender, like a lowercase y, the part of it that sticks down below the baseline is the descender. And it used to be that underlines would just draw right through that. Right. And now there's what's known as ink skipping, and I'm doing air quotes here because it's not ink, it's pixels on a on a screen, but it's still, the idea is that the, the underline comes along and then where it reaches a place where it would overwrite part of a, of a, of a glyph, right? What we would think of as ink, what we can think of as ink here, there's a break in the, in the, uh, in the, in the underline or the decoration. Um, this ink skipping typically happens with underlining. It's not supposed to happen with line throughs, I believe. Although maybe it does right now and and strike through, you mean? Yeah, sorry, strike through. Yeah, and, it's it's not, I think. Right. Um, and maybe with overline right. So again, this gets complicated. <laughs> um but so there was a question of, hey, can we use decoration skipping to just turn off underlines? And the resolution there was actually to add a new property called text decoration skip self. Right, which is a which will be. Could we clarify a little bit? Well, it'll be related to text decoration skip and uh, for skipping ancestor decorations. So, what this is about is like if you have a, a sentence or a paragraph or or some text run mm -hmm. that is supposed to be underlined, and there's just some part of it that shouldn't be underlined. Right, uh, you need a way to say ink skip on this. A part of the thing that came up in here is about subscripts and superscripts and where you draw the underline yes and how is that related is it related to ink skipping yeah which which is which is what that first issue that that we mentioned was about was like what's the underlying position when you're decorating a box that's higher or lower than the regular position so if you have we'll just go with h2o right and the two is uh, is supposed to be a subscript because that's how you know, atomic configurations are written. And then you have underlined H2O because you really want to draw attention to it. Does the underline, like, in effect, break? It goes under the H and then it breaks and, and goes under the two and then comes breaks again and comes back up and goes under the O? Or should it look like there's a single underline and the two just interrupts it? Like, that's that's not a resolved question. <laughs> and or... or <laughs> Or should the underline be under even the two? Right. I, I then, mean, when you look at the issue, there's uh, like a number of different ways that this is done today. And they're all subtly different. And some of them look really good. And some of them look not so good. Yep. And I think actually people agree on which one they think looks good and bad too. So somewhat subjective. Right. But it, it it is just interesting because it's phenomenally. I can't think of anything that seems easier in my head at first than like just to underline the thing, like just underline it. Like didn't we didn't we figure that out in like 1996 or something, right? Like right. Except just underline it. Sometimes, well, that can be interpreted various ways. And then you know, there's the question of what happens if you have a a superscript instead of a subscript. Like again, should the underline sort of go up to follow it or should it just and there are a lot of different ways that you can approach this and the answers that seem obvious for things like a subscript to or a superscript uh, asterisk for a footnote kind of a thing lead to possibly unwanted results if you like superscript citation needed 
as you can see in Wikipedia, like that's that's a that's a superscript in quite a few places is citation needed. And you might not get the results you want there given certain answers for you know the more common cases. Anyway, like there's no resol there actually isn't a resolution on this. There was a discussion, uh there were uh, various alternatives considered and uh I believe the next steps are to actually do a developer survey for um you know some alternatives to be presented and have the community vote. Um which yeah. I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to. <laughs> yeah, there were so uh I might have mixed them up so I guess we can just treat them as one yeah. unit under typography. But we there was a resolution on one issue, which was about um, the text decoration skip. Like yeah. giving you a way to say, like, this little run of this, this element, even if it would inherit an underline, should not ink. Yep. Um, and the other one is has to do with, like, where you where you draw the underlines. <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting uh, to see what the community thinks. Yeah. But then we had element sizing, which was one of those things where when it started out, I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. And then it very quickly descended into weeds and I was just like, uh, I, I don't even know. Like, I don't even know what I should think here. <laughs> element sizing obviously is important in so many contexts. Um, and so this is, kind of a a mashup of two broad sub issues one was about um if you have a text area and you just want the text area to be as big as it needs to be according to its contents which is like a common thing yeah um, how do you do that in how do you do that right <laughs> well and we should be clear how does it continue to be the size of its contents as its contents change, like as a person types into the text area and they start going the multiple lines of text, how do you allow the text area to be sized by its contents? And in CSS at the moment, you you can't. Yeah. Right? And like you get this in some, like you at least get the sense of this from some editors, right? Like some editors do something like this with the content editable or something and, and try to make it, do this sort of thing right but it's currently hard and there is uh, a proposal that we add a new keyword value called max content but we were actually not able to come to any resolution right max content for height i i think I, it's not exactly a new keyword i mean you can do max content now but support support for it right yeah because it's not clear i guess from the current specification that that's a thing that should update <laughs> right <laughs> right Dynam dynamically as the user inputs things because that's the thing css has stuff that's meant to respond to user action mm -hmm. but sort of by default that's not that's not really how it works <laughs> um like sort of the base of css doesn't really it wasn't designed that way let me put let, let's say that and so a lot of the stuff that it responds to user interaction has been put, you know, been layered on after the sort of the foundation was laid. Yeah, it's not it's not super easy. And why this has to do with user interaction, maybe, is because um, like it's a form field. It, like it's right. not it's not just content. Obviously, if you like use JavaScript and added a letter every second like we would know like the height of that and everything like it, it mm -hmm. would be a different thing because like actually the dom itself changed and everything but text areas have always been different and special and like a lot of them have <laughs> a little grippy that you can I don't, I don't know if that's standard anymore like if, it, if it's implemented everywhere but at least some browsers used to add the grippy so the user could resize it mm -hmm. um and yeah that's always been an interesting challenge but we got no resolution on that one the other group was uh around containment issues which is very interesting i don't know i don't know how many listeners would actually know about 
this whole thing that CSS is doing now where it actually has a property called contain. And the idea is to sort of, it's to contain certain aspects of layout calculation to an element and its descendants. Basically, it's it's CSS used for page optimization. Um, like, sorry, page layout optimization, right? It's telling the browser, hey, here's a way you can optimize your calculations here. So you can say, like, contain paint, which, as far as I can tell, is functionally equivalent to overflow hidden in terms of what happens on the what the user experiences but it's a way of flagging to browsers hey you don't have to calculate painting outside the bounds of this element even if some of its descendant elements might stick outside of it or be outside of it but there's like size containment where you can effectively tell the browser uh don't recalculate the size uh if uh, you know if it seems like like don't don't go through the size calculations unless you are explicitly forced to in a in a sense mm -hmm. and yeah so there's there's that contain property and then that brings along with it this concept of last remembered sizing which is not a property it's not something that that authors can explicitly address necessarily but there were literally three different uh issues around mm -hmm. last remember this last remembered size and it's like is the last remembered size actually remembered if the size containment is only on a single axis because you can contain the width calculations but not the height calculations or vice versa or the block calculations versus the inline calculations and so there was a question of hey if there's size containment only on the block axis but not on the inline axis should the last remembered size be recorded like should the browser remember that last remembered size and the resolution was it's tracked independently for the two axes. I think uh, one of the things that is like, if you're on the outside of things looking in, um, it's easy to like see something like containment and say like, gee, how important is that? Like, it seems like I've been hearing about this in, you know, somebody has been bringing it up for a couple of years now. <clears throat> and like, I can't imagine ever using it. <laughs> Um, because it's just about performance, but, uh, a lot of things, again, like any software project, um, there are bits inside it that are common and used. There's like the foundations that you build on. And sometimes you hit a point where you want something that you, you can't get there from here. Mm. <laughs> you like you're internals don't have the necessary sort of prerequisites and building blocks. And so you have to take some time to build those things, which are themselves like maybe moderately useful or useful in very particular cases, mm -hmm. but their real value has to do a lot with providing you the building blocks you need for other things. So for example, uh, containment is very useful for performance potentially. And there are definitely use cases where, um, that really, really matters. Like you're doing things that are very intense uh, and need like need to update a lot. Right. Where doing all the work every time would be too much. And like if you have the information to say up front, this isn't that, then you can really give a hint to the browser and make it a lot more performant. But in many ways, the real value of containment isn't that. And um, you have to, we want to specify things for like container queries and like, how do you know when this thing has been resized? Um, so we had like resize observer and um, all of these things then share concepts throughout the specs that like are the fundamentals. And so all of these questions really have to do with like, sort of different parts of the system. Two of them were talking about like how, how resizers observers work uh -huh. and um, like what happens in this particular case, because it's like, it's not clear in the spec and you could interpret it a few ways. Right. Yeah. I, I think another thing that is like worth mentioning there, I guess, is that, um, Greg Whitworth, when he was at 
uh, Microsoft was, I think, one of the primary editors of Resize Observer, did a, a lot of great work to get that going. Mm-hmm. And then he left for Salesforce. And so he's not currently able to do that, I think. And so we added two more editors to the mm-hmm. Resize Observer spec, mm-hmm. uh, which are Emilio Cobos from Mozilla and Oreo Bravo from Egalia. Which is super good because like the two of them that's <laughs> they have to worry about this stuff a lot it was interesting to me that there were i recorded three and i think there were a couple more that i just didn't include in our in our show notes issues that were just about is last remembered size a thing in this context okay what about this context okay in this set of circumstances what should we do about last remembered size it's not actually a thing that authors will ever particularly need to worry about directly right this this concept of last remembered size the only thing that authors and for that matter users really need to care about is have all of these issues of all of these questions around this last remembered size concept been resolved to the you know in a way that the contained property really does give performance benefits and not be sort of a waste well and importantly too uh does it work consistently across all browsers and all places where the same like underlying fundamentals are used. So like you don't want some something else like container queries and resize servers should be working with like the same kinds of concepts. Yeah. And what you don't want is for the the web is full of very creative people. <laughs> and someone somewhere will do something probably something very cool. And it won't work in one browser or it will work differently in all three browsers. Right. Because you bump up against these kinds of things. And so what, when you see these kinds of groups of issues, it's because somebody is working on something related to that and they're providing another set of eyeballs and often a slightly different context. So like if you're working on resize the server a few years ago, like there weren't container queries and there weren't, you know, now we have other things. We have other contexts. We go back, we look at it with fresh eyes. We've been, maybe we've looked at other implementations now. And we said like, Oh yeah, we're like, our implementation is not asking these questions that seem to be asked in the other, you know, Mm -hmm. or I implemented this and then I went to test it and it works subtly differently in my implementation than it does in this other browser. So you tend to see like a, a a group of issues like this when something like that happens. And also when we're working on the year long interop projects, yeah, because we say um, there is a slew of interop issues that we identified. Get them. <laughs> yep. OK, so then uh, scroll linked animations. Yeah. So, I mean, scrolling to animations, another way to think of these is scroll triggered animations. So it's the idea that as the user is scrolling to the page and elements become visible, there should be a way to trigger an animation as a thing becomes visible, right? Because right now, if you want to do that, you have to use JavaScript in, in some way. You have to, I don't know, flip a class or something to basically say, oh, this thing is visible and now we want the we want the butterfly to fly away across the screen because, you know, now it's visible. Um, And so there, this is a concept that's being hashed out and hopefully will be coming to browsers relatively soon where you can just in CSS say, Hey, when this thing is visible, then do this transition or play this animation. Um, And so there were lots of questions like, uh, like how does CSS even, express that right and how do you address things like the beginning or the end of that transition process um if you can like can you name a timeline and if so like what's the scope of that um do we you know is there a way to uh is there or should there be a way to uh name these sort of these sort of 
containers, as it were, the for these animations. So the the way that it's being talked about now, as I understand it, is that you sort of define like a container for a given animation, not in the well, maybe sort of in the contained sense. Anyway, you basically you say this animation is dependent on this quote unquote container, this thing that we've wrapped around this animation. And then when that when that container enters the view, then you can trigger things. And when it exits the view, you can trigger things. Maybe it's like this scroll port, more or less? Kind of. Yeah. You you sort of define a define a scroll port or Another way, I guess, to think of it would be to define the thing that triggers this animation. <laughs> but that's like a, it's a, it contains a trigger, right? In a sense, right? And and that trigger is, you know, when when this trigger becomes visible, then we can we enter into this transition, and when it becomes not visible, we can exit out of it. Um, yeah, and yeah, there were just there were the. I mean, working that, trying to work that out leads to, you know, as with anything, led to a lot of different things like, you know, entry, exit transitions for view timeline effects and name timelines and container name references, which there are, uh, at the moment, the scroll function, which is how some of these things will be expressed, will not have container names in it at this point. And that's actually, that, that points to what I think is a, is an important guiding principle of the CSS working group. Um, they really do their utmost in all circumstances to do the like the minimum and not the minimum in the sense of we're being lazy, but the minimum in the sense of we're not actually sure if this thing is necessary, so we're not going to do it at first. All right, so maybe it will turn out that the scroll function needs container name references, which to anyone listening, if you don't understand that, that's fine. I'm not sure I totally understand it myself. But the point being that, you know, maybe the scroll function doesn't need this. So the working group has tends to have this principle of, okay, if we're not sure that it's needed, we're not going to put it in. We're not going to just add this thing in case it's needed someday. Two things I would add to that. So one, just like any other software project, <laughs> um, you set out with... Um, goals right like you have goals and along the way people have ideas that like get added on but at some point you have like you have to ship a project right like you have to ship something and say that's that's done uh and when you're going through w3c process we have levels and eventually at some point we need to say okay this is the spec that we're aiming to get everybody interoperably implemented and in rec right and so sometimes when it looks like it, there's a bunch of ideas here and there's there's a bunch of things that are even maybe potentially clearly useful needs, but we don't really know how to do them. And paring down the scope of what we're doing allows us to get it done and mm -hmm. ship it and get interoperable implementations. And I think an important part is that then you get some use from real developers. Yeah, And you see which questions are asked and where they're prioritizing things, because as you had a great talk on this, like, like, there's just not enough people <laughs> to yeah. do all of the things. And so we are constantly having to prioritize work. And mm -hmm. so having a shipped thing that is like interoperable and then taking a beat and seeing where people are asking questions or complaining the things they're asking for is useful input as to like when we should tackle that. So we try to do a good job of <clears throat> delivering like the fundamental value. And occasionally it means paring down some of these things that we don't know the answer to that. Um, we're not sure. Right. Uh, and we don't, we don't know how useful or necessary it is. So let's see. Yeah. And, and I think that's worth calling out because the working group did not always operate on that principle. Right. If you go back far enough, and this is a fair ways back, but if you go back far enough, there was there was definitely an idea, sort of an attitude of, well, this is interesting, and we can imagine that these other things that are part of, that might be a, a good part of that. So we'll just put them in there, right? Even if they weren't hard to implement, and so you know, some of them the working group was right, and some of them were things that just kind of 
withered because nobody ever really used them or they actually ended up making doing useful things more difficult because they sort of got in the way. <laughs> um, and so there's, there's really been a, a, a institutional, I guess, uh, lesson learned there, which is to sort of ship that minimum viable product so that it's useful and interoperable, ideally, but doesn't go too far overboard at at first with the well, this might be useful, so we'll we'll include it. That will make people happy, and we'll include this other thing, and this other thing, and this other thing. Like all these all these things that we think will make some people happy. And it's like you know, you might be right, but you might also have just stuck something in there that nobody's ever going to bother to use because it's not actually what authors will want. Yeah, it's definitely an optimization problem. There's the real like minima maxima there as to like how you approach that. And I think the thing that even just the software industry at large has learned, I mean, this, this comes down to like, we used to do everything was waterfall mm. and <laughs> you would take a really lot of time, like thinking through all the things and like trying to deliver one big push. Yeah. And if you get the big push and it's good, that's, awesome and it is actually really can it can be really efficient but um in practice a lot of times most of the time <laughs> you're stuck with zero value until the end and then in the real world we you, you can't, can't predict what is actually useful yeah very well so i think breaking things down so that users get some value more quickly, even if it's not the total value and then laying the foundations so that you can use that to build bigger and more complex things and get more information about what should be prioritized is generally a good practice, I think. But the CSS yeah. working group is also very careful about raising those questions as soon as we have them. So that at least mm -hmm we're thinking about them and not like creating evolutionary dead ends where like we can't get to that solution ever, you know? Right. I think another thing that is like a common theme in a lot of issues that will actually come back in the next section, I think, uh, there are a lot of things about names and scopes mm. because the web uh, began as really a single document. And then we got the ability to embed some documents like images. Mm -hmm. And we also then got the ability to embed frames and you can embed SVG documents and you can embed SVG documents as images and you can embed SV document, SVG documents and iframes. <laughs> right. And um, then now also we have shadow Dom, which is like also its own embedded fragment document yep you know css was a little bit unprepared for some of that because it was like its premise was pretty simple it's just like you, you give it a global name and then you can use it yep. and just be careful um <laughs> and you know even even in a lot of real world scenarios that is like even in a single document that can get very tricky as you work like many teams in the same website potentially yeah um or shared things like you know design systems and and shared components that go across many projects it can get tricky already but now we have this like none of those names are are visible from there and like sometimes maybe you need information to sort of travel between these two boundaries now, also, now that we have container queries, there's this idea of sort of like scopes of in the same document. So the one that I think you mentioned, well, there are actually two in here, I think, that have to do with this. So, so one is like, okay, so you make a component, like a custom element that you share, and it has like a shadow boundary, right? Um, like can it participate in those like how <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's things that we have to there's whole new concepts in here that we have to think about that we didn't have to think about before yeah one of them uh, one of the things that i think is a a little more concrete for some people is uh is there a way to pass colors and stuff into svg images 
Yes. So if, if the SVG image is like literally embedded in the document, like if the SVG markup is part of the HTML, that's fairly simple, right? You can, from the document style sheet, you can say, you know, the fill of this thing should be blah and the, the, the stroke color of this other thing should be blah in order to fix with the theme. But if you're using IMG SRC equals something, something, something dot SVG, CSS has no way to talk to the internals of that SVG file, which, I mean, I've run into many times where I've... Absolutely. Yeah, I, I also have. Yeah, eventually you're like, I'm going to have to embed it. Like, I'm going to have to use includes in my templating system to pull this thing in here just so I can change the color of the icon in this SVG file um, when the user switches from dark mode to light mode, right? Um, which sometimes that's that's a good idea for performance reasons, right? Like sometimes you do want to inline the SVG, but it's not always. and. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you pass that information? And so there's been a proposal, Tab Atkins, in fact, had a proposal for what is called an SVG parameters specification, and the working group resolved to adopt that as an editor's draft. So basically moved it onto the first rung of the yeah. specification track, right? Because t Tab's specification wasn't on any sort of a... Uh, a track. It, it's like, you know, if I just wrote a specification for, you know, my cool CSS property, like I can make it look like a W3C specification, but until the working group accepts it, it's not really on the track. Well, the working group has accepted this. And I don't think we should get too deep into the weeds on this because it could, it could completely change, but that's making it an editor's draft means that now it's, it's being seriously considered as how, how do we pass information from the HTML document or from JavaScript or from, you know, whatever into an external SVG. And then I think probably part of that discussion will end up being, okay, but how do, how do we, can we adopt these same principles for other situations that are not SVG, but, you know, like you were talking about, it's an iframe or it's a, um, a, a, sh a shadow DOM component or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the, I, I used, I used the example of dark and light mode on purpose because two of the other things that were talked about was how do you, like, if you have a color scheme in media queries, right? Like prefers color scheme, whatever, can that be propagated into SVG images? Uh, can it be propagated into iframes? Like, mm -hmm. is there a context dependence in there? Those were resolved uh, by the working group um, with the iframes. The resolution was that the context-dependent color scheme, so the light mode versus dark mode propagation, does work for iframes, including cross-origin iframes, unless it's in some way specifically restricted by the author. Right. So basically, the working group said browsers should propagate the prefers color scheme value into iframes, even if you're pulling the source of the iframe from a completely different uh, origin. There was a lot of, there had to be a lot of discussion about that around like security and cross-site scripting. And yeah, you know, like, have we, have we thought this all the way through and is there anything that we're, you know, we're not, we're not considering and, and, but that's, I mean, that's, that's a big step. It doesn't sound like a big step probably, but it is, it's a big step. <laughs> yeah. So this is, we already have started on the, the next group, which is values and units. So we made that transition. So there's a, a bunch of issues in here that are related to values and units. And this one uh, is something that was started by Tab. And just to clarify a little thing on the W3C specs, um, at, like, at some point you go from vague idea to more concrete details. And the process for this is like sort of whatever works, really. <laughs> Um, so it's recommended that you start as an explainer, which doesn't do that. And then it goes through a process and maybe it's incubated. Um, but very frequently when there are editors who are on a working group, particularly the CSS working group who like has had for a long time, its own concept of incubating ideas, like the editors will just go and make something that looks pretty speckish and then say, um, this is like the thing that I'm thinking and it lays out like the use cases and the scenarios and everything. 
And I would like to move it to like, I would like the CSS working group to take it up and start an editor's draft, maybe with this as the first thing. And the editor's draft is, as you say, it could completely change. Like all the editor's draft means is that the CSS working group has formally taken up the use cases and the vague idea. Um, it like it could radically change. Like it could be mm -hmm. maybe not even using URL at all. Uh, there was some proposals in there about how we do a sort of an import export idea with uh, like custom properties uh, that you could that you could pass down, for example. So that will be super interesting. And uh, I also wanted to point again to the complexity of things and say, I don't know wh like what it came up in, mm -hmm. but uh, Ian Kilpatrick from Google uh, had one of my favorite quotes from the whole thing, which was, um, seems simple, but is full of terrors. <laughs> and it's true. Like there's so many things that like, it seems very, very simple. Like you just, how hard could it be? Like, I just want to say, I, I just want you to respect the background color that I give you, right? But there are cases where, like, what if the thing you pass down is a URL? Right. And then that means I am I have an opportunity to embed an image that I'm going to serve from my server, even though it's your SVG image or something. And there are, like, lots of things you have to think about there uh, about privacy and security. Yeah. And uh, it gets really tricky. There's... Almost nothing is simple. <laughs> Certainly not at this point. Um, yeah, and actually, since you mentioned values and units, one of my favorite things, even though it it seems wacky, is the introduction of the uh, of, of chaos that will come from the random and random item functions. <laughs> Which yeah, so there's this is another proposal from Tab. I I think about this like even all the time because so Tab Atkins is also on ECMA uh, TC39. You know, again, we have things in the platform that explain magic and like we want <laughs> to not have different answers for those questions. Right. Um, like an example of this that is totally unrelated is uh, in MathML, there was this coevolution and in MathML, the first spec arrived before CSS. And so there are just like there were in HTML at the time like effectively presentational attributes that you could set. Um, so there's a math color that is a, a effectively the color attribute in HTML. Yeah. Again, like, what is a color, right? Like and anybody would expect that you should be able to put red in there and it should be probably red. <laughs> right. But like, should math, should MathML define every possible serialization of a color, like what, what colors, what set of color names, what you don't want to do that. You want to say CSS knows how to do colors. Like anything right. that's a valid CSS color is valid here. Mm -hmm. And then you want to also say like, and by the way, this is a presentational hint and you probably shouldn't even use it, <laughs> but yeah, we don't want multiple things having to rethink and have different answers on the edges. And so I think, tab is focused on some of the bits that we need for random things that are even like javascript doesn't have a big standard library so uh people use like lodash or, or underscore which allows you to say like uh here's a list of six things just give me one at random right and like you have to program that today and there are lots of ways to get it like subtly wrong or different than other things where it's like not true random or like it's not what you wanted mm -hmm. or to be able to say just give me an integer between one and a hundred right that is surprisingly easy to get wrong because it like it's basically a one or two line function but it involves math and if like you have to protect against cases like what if you say from zero to ten then all the all the multiplication just is zero like i you know so right it's just like subtle silly little things that everybody has to do again so i think it would be nice that if we had some good standard library stuff around random personally like mm -hmm. i i want those things all the time for little pet projects that i do yeah and uh i find myself like 
not wanting to import something and just like rewriting the same functions over and over. Um, right. So yeah, these would be random and random items. So those would be basically the two that I talked about, which is like, this should be like an integer between one and 500. Yeah. Or uh, here are three possible background values. I don't like just give me one at random. Like I want you to just alternate. They're like, there's no rhyme or reason. Just give me one. Mm -hmm. And it should be different every time. And both of these, I think, have also a, a, a flag in their proposal that's like, should it generate different for every element or just like one for the document? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think those will be really interesting. And we'll have to wait and see because I think it's pending tabs work in ECMA. Oh, uh, yeah. But I, I agree. Those are really those are really interesting. And I can't wait to see what people do because it will be fun, right? Yep. <laughs> people will do fun things. And th and all of them won't be wacky. I mean, you know, I don't think people are just going to like randomly throw random everywhere. Uh, but there are some interesting ideas like like backgrounds. If you have several backgrounds and you just want to say like, I don't know, I just want it to change sometimes. Right. You know, um, just for the sake of being interesting. Yeah, and where uh, where random might come in super handy is inside calc, right? Where you can say, "I want this. I want these things to be placed based on this calculation, but this calculation has some random to turn in, so that you can scatter cards a little bit, so they're not like in this very perfect grid. They, yeah, they, they have a little bit of of organicness to them, where you could throw in not just a you could randomly offset them by a few pixels from where they would start and maybe uh, somewhere, you know, something between zero and one and a half percent rotation. Right. Yeah. So that they end up looking, like I say, much more organic rather than very sort of sterile grid kind of thing. Um, yeah. So that would be super interesting. But uh there was one that I, I know we wanted to talk about uh, before we ran out of time and we're almost out of time, which was the question about box shadows and border radius and spread and shadow spread. Yeah. I, you thought this was, you thought, I mean, I agree with you, but you flagged this as something that you thought was super interesting. I, I flagged this because it was really, really interesting to me because uh, if you, I encourage people to go look at the issues. I think it is issue number uh, 7103 in CSS working group drafts. And it's very clear that there is not a right answer to this question, right? Uh, there, there's not like an objectively correct answer to how we're going to do this. There's trade-offs. Uh -huh. And uh, the reason that it's very interesting is it's like one of the many examples that we already mentioned, Oriel, uh, Earlier, Oriol is in a galleon. He works here with us. And he's in the CSS working group. He is the one of the editors of CSS Grid. Um, and all of the issues that we talked about previously are um, on element sizing. He, he opened all of those. And he did a bunch of work here. He He's very big on maps. And uh, he did a bunch of work in here. created like a bunch of demos and suggested like that we could do it like this and we could do it like this and we could do it mm -hmm. like this and illustrated them all. And I just, I wanted to put it on here because A, I think people should look at it and they, sh they should weigh in. But also just because I wanted to say like every time I'm in the CSS working group and I see that Oriel has issues on there and he gets to speak, I feel like, I am very proud to be like in the same company and you know, he is just amazingly smart. And I feel a little bit like the uh, goodwill hunting scene where uh, he sort of like knocks on the window and his whole comment that he can add to the conversation is just, my boy is wicked smart. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that is how I feel in when Oriole is speaking. He's just, very very smart and I, I love the work that he does on css working group we're really lucky that he's in a galleon I think. yeah absolutely and yeah this was it's kind of like the first thing we were talking about with the underlining and the decoration and the superscript and the subscript this is like you said this is another situation where there's no like obviously right answer there's 
there are various answers that you would probably get everyone to agree are, is the are the you know it's like this answer is the right answer in this context yeah, but then yeah. when you change the context suddenly it's the wrong answer and there are cases where you could get everybody to agree no not that one that that's right. like yeah. we can all agree that's the wrong answer right <laughs> um but yeah there's again this it is subjective and there's there's not like a right answer here and we have to pick something and it feels like people will uh, sort of agree and we got to try to find where we get it you know 80 percent agreement and and i mean part of the conversation was well should we have what's effectively a discontinuous algorithm here should we say in these contexts we do this thing but in these other contexts we do this we do a different thing right to try to get closer to something that everyone can agree on but like Nobody really likes that idea. <laughs> Nobody yeah. likes the idea of, well, above the this value, but, you know, above this threshold and this value, but below this threshold and this value, then we do this algorithm, but then the other, you know, in this other range of values, we do another algorithm. Like, nope, nobody really wants to do that. I mean, I think the working group will, if they, if I, like, if they decide it is important enough, I would, I think they would be willing to, specify that something like that but nobody really wants to to do it that way <laughs> yeah <laughs> would yeah. rather find a, a solution where there's one algorithm that like one you know thing that is used across all cases and we just we have to accept that it sort of visually breaks down in certain places that's the one of the core challenges of the css working group is we're work is that we and they and browsers are working with visual presentation for the most part. I mean, that's what CSS is really about. And you run into situations like the one in this, in this uh, particular issues where if you have an element that you've turned into a circle with border radius, mm -hmm. then you want the box shadow to be a circle. But the, the way that you can define that most easily then means that if, it's not a full circle <laughs> if it's uh if the element it ellipse. If, it, if the element is an ellipse or if the element just has uh you know mostly straight sides but really deep um border radius rounding then the results of that algorithm that was defined to make a circle look like it has a circle shadow suddenly the shadow doesn't look right mm -hmm. but then if you do uh, an algorithm that makes it look right when it's not a circle or an ellipse, then it, you can probably make it work for a circle, but then it breaks down for an ellipse, right? Like these are the trade-offs. So that's what they're trying to work through. And like I say, our, there's no resolution yet, right? Like this has been, all these alternatives have been presented like Oreo, like you said, like came up with new algorithms for calculating box shadow with spread and made demos and made demos right and, and has proposed them and has also pointed out yeah this this works for the thing that we first brought up but now it causes breakdown in this other place and what do we, like are we okay with that and the working group hasn't decided and sometimes that's that's how it goes i could I don't, there was, there was no re explicit resolution to like put this one in front of the developer community for a vote. Yeah. Cause I don't think the working group is there yet. They're hoping, uh, the hope is always that they can come up with a solution for something and not have to like bug people for their time to vote on stuff. It's very difficult with things like this because um, <laughs> you will inevitably wind up with two, two problems. So, so we'll come up with maybe two or three answers that we can't choose from. And we'll say A, B, or C. Mm -hmm. um, and first, there will be a whole bunch of people that like respond with D. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and like that's actively usually not helpful because like we have considered D and E and F, you know, and they're they're like kind of non options. Yep. We don't want to add more possible choices, probably. It's very hard to filter through all of them. Not that a good idea or a solution couldn't come that way. It's just when we run a poll, it's like we can't choose A, A, or B, for example. And one of the things 
anytime there's anything that is remotely subjective, we put it to a poll. It is almost always 50, 50. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, like, it's regardless of, it's not just CSS. I mean, it's everything in the web platform. Like I, I can point to a few that just come to mind immediately. Uh, Dominic D. Nicola, when they were taking up uh, like new HTML elements, you know, mm -hmm. uh, he said, you know, we follow this practice about like how we specify them and whether they're like match the OS or whether they're like browser consistent. So if you use it in Chrome, like, does it look like the same thing in Chrome, no matter the operating system or does it match the operating system? So it's things like inputs and buttons and things. We like kind of never really totally agreed on that. And it's caused like a bunch of problems. And Dominic said, hey, you know, we don't have to do that. <laughs> um, we could specify exactly how it should work. And so, like, I'm curious, should it work like this or should it work like this? And I'm, I thought, well, there's really only one right answer there, right? Like, I mean, I, I it seemed very clearly A to me. Right. And I was excited about that because I thought, like, maybe we can get past this this set of problems that we have. So I kept checking on it, and uh, yeah, it was exactly 50-50 in the end. It got like a really lot of votes, and it was exactly 50-50, and it's not at all uncommon. I think of that as uh, Cardell's first law of polls, is that given any subjective choice, the the uh, results will be statistically 50-50. Yeah, definitely. I can't believe we managed to fill this much time. I, I thought, actually, this would be like a relatively quick one. <laughs> Um, but I think we've like, we've covered pretty much everything. I think the only thing that we didn't cover is, uh, that, uh, CH units and font downloads and let's not get into it because we spent a lot of time. And, and also, and also because it hasn't been resolved yet. So, right. But also it is just like really, really interesting. You would think, I mean, it's just a new unit. Like why, you know, like what's the big deal? It's a big deal because it refers to. A font and you can't measure the font if you don't have the font basically <laughs> so right. if you use one it can cause a font to download okay uh thanks uh oh, thank you yeah and uh we'll see everybody next time latest